What, I'm just a grown man eating yoghurt? Hello and welcome to another episode of Webflow and Code where I teach you the underlying code you're writing in Webflow. Yes, I'm still making Webflow videos. Uh, I've just been enjoying myself recently exploring Pine Grow, which is a new tool that I've just been playing around with and, and learning. I also started a podcast with my good friend, Chris Adams, where we talk about all things technology. So those things have been kind of eating up my time recently, as well as just being generally busy with client work. This episode will be part of a series which um, delves into everything to do with forms. And it's been a series that I've been meaning to do recently. It's been quite popular on my channel, discussing forms and kind of what they do and the, the workings behind them. So today will be a introduction to the different form elements on Webflow, what you can do with them, what the intended use for them is, and then we'll be previewing the code and just taking a look and understanding what, what the HTML actually means and i hope that the, the series will go right through to actually using the forms with javascript and then finishing off publishing to a back end whether it's php or whatever and kind of understanding what is actually happening when you submit a form so if that sounds exciting to you then hit the subscribe button because like i say this will be a series and if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out then you must hit the notification bell icon so sit back, relax, and enjoy the first in a series of forms. Before we start, I just wanted to announce that this week's episode of That Tech Show is featuring Joe Krug. That Tech Show is my podcast, which you can find more information about at thattech.show. So the first things first, here we have a form element. Uh, a form block rather. Um, what it contains is a form, a uh, success message and an error message. And I got that through the uh, component pane. And you've got various different elements here. So let's just start by looking at the raw form. If I preview this and inspect the code, what you'll see is that we have a form, um, of course, and we have labels that uh, a label and an input and a uh, submit button. You can think of a form as kind of wrapping a data set. So I've explained this in the past. Um, you can have multiple forms on a page. You can have multiple forms on a site. It's, it's wrapping a set of information that you want to send to the back end, right? In, in the default case, it's going to be Webflow. But like I say, later on in the series, we, we're going to learn to kind of post it elsewhere. And um, so the form represents a data set. It could be, I mean, in this example, it looks like a contact field. It could be a sign up form for your email list. Any sort of set of data that you want to send to the back end use a form. If you have a different data set, then I would advise you having a different form. If say you've got a contact form and a sign up form for an email address on your website, use different, use two forms. Don't try and bundle them together. Don't try and do anything clever like that. Um, really a form is a set of data that's sort of self-contained in some ways. So looking into the, the markup of this form, you can see that the form has a name and this will be something that the, you know, the, um, Webflow's backend will register as obviously the name of the form. Now they've got an ID here and some various other things. This is just Webflow adding things in. Really, this is nothing um, that is essential for for the markup of a form. So it's just the name and the and the ID. Then we have a label. And once again, these data W things are just junk that Webflow adds that's doing things in its back end. I'm just previewing this. Actually, this could be removed in, the, in when you publish it. So, um, but the important thing is on the label is this four attributes. So this is so super, super crucial. And I think Webflow does a terrible job at, at sort of um, communicating this and also enabling you to, to do this because I've never been able to um, achieve this but you every single form element needs a label this is an accessibility thing and the way it does that is that whatever text right now it's name whatever um, whatever label this belongs to the for attribute represents the id of the element that it's representing so in this case we've got form so there must be an input element with an id of name somewhere there's the id there 
And the important thing to remember that I, I continue to say is there should only be one instance of an ID on your page. You should not not that you cannot, because absolutely you can, because again, Webflow is not doing a very good job at um, communicating this. There can only be one instance of an element, no matter what it is, of uh, with an ID of name on this page. It can be elsewhere. There can be an element with an ID of name on another page, but there cannot be another element with an ID of name on this page. That's why you can confidently say this for represents this ID. Now the name attribute, that is the, the, the labeling, let's say, of the data that's going to be sent to the front end. So whatever's, whatever the value is of this input element, it's going to be recognized as name. And that's how we do it. I think, I think Webflow does something slightly clever and actually take the actual text that you insert into the label um, as, the, as the name. Um, but what's really happening is the name attribute is, is going to be sent there. So once again, yeah, we have a we have a label with a four of name, which re, re, represents, uh, which reflects the ID of this input element. The name, like I say, is for the back end, and we've got a max length here of two five six. I mean, that's just a default value, and I don't believe you can actually change that inside of Webflow. But that's obviously an attribute that you can do. You can set a max length. If you were to go to input uh, element HTML, if you were to look at some documentation here documentation for the input element if we scroll down we can actually see um, we can see all the different types that it can be so it can be type let's just jump back here and uh, pay reference to that this is type text so there can be type checkbox it can be type color it can be cut type date date time local and and you can see a representation of here as how it's going to how it's going to render it could be a type file you can then you can actually add these in uh, as attributes if you want them so you've got lots of different types here and then we look at the attributes. We've got uh, accept, which ha which is for a type file. So we're not really concerned with that right now. But you know, if it was um, an input of alt uh, with image, then you can have an alt. Let's scroll down to well, let's look at all. We've got autocomplete, autofocus, uh, disabled form, which actually associates the the form element to a form elsewhere on the page. So actually that's new to me. I actually only thought that was available on the submit button, but it looks like you can you can have a form element anywhere on the page and with the form attribute, you, you can associate it with an ID of the form. Scrolling through, uh, is it max length? There's the one we saw, minimum length. I'm not gonna go through all these, but you can see that if you just type in HTML input, you can see what it can be and what different types of attributes you can use on your input. So jumping back in here then, this is a default of max length 24256. And once again, we have an input of type submit. Webflow doesn't have the idea of buttons, actual button elements, which is kind of strange because they're actually very, very crucial for interactions on a website. But it's perfectly okay to have an input of type submit. And once again, normally these data things are to do with uh, web flow. We're not really concerned with these data attributes, but class is obviously something we're familiar with. And the value is obviously the text that goes within there. If you were, if you needed to uh, have some sort of HTML inside of um, your input, uh, in, inside of your button, then you would need to use a button um, because you can only put text values inside of this button. So you'd use a HTML um, element and you create a button and then, then you can put in some graphics, some icons, some different text or, or whatever. So that's the bare minimum kind of form there. I don't think there's anything more to say on that. Um, you can obviously change these uh, waiting text, you know, button text. You can obviously change all these things inside of the form. So looking into the settings of a form, I've gone over this in a previous episode, but just to quickly run through, of course, you can add an ID. Right now, it's been given the ID of form, if we, if, if I remember correctly. You can show the state, and this allows you just to play around with the uh, different states, so you can style them how, how you'd like. All this is doing is on submit, uh, Webflow is hiding the form and showing either success or error but depending on these things there's nothing more to it than that you can see these rendered in the preview um, just as hidden elements 
the form name again giving it a form name where it redirects to and i would i would suggest watching my other video on the forms um we kind of go into a little bit more detail around this and the different method types um and the actions and various things like that on the on the label you can't really do anything but on the input you can have a, a name and uh, an id and a name and various things like that once again i've never been able to drag an input in and then drag a, f a form element in it so if i drag an input in here and then webflow tells me that it once i drag an input and then drag a label it should automatically associate those things so if i just preview that and have a little look i can almost guarantee so there's no for attribute on that and so i would i would need to say form uh, for sorry field i mean i can change that to whatever i want but i would i would need to change the for attribute of the label to field but unfortunately it's a reserved name so i can't do that webflow sort it out what is going on there for uh, again in my other video i explain what you can do if your design does not show the um doesn't 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 want to show for whatever reason the the labels my other video goes into that but long story short you can use the sr only class so that's the kind of default form let's just remove those there and now let's dig into the actual elements the different types of elements themselves and i can kind of explain them so an input type like we like i said the input type can be very very lots of different types um, and you can even select those in in this plane is obviously equal to text when we look at the elements that are the types that are available um, scrolling down text that's the default email which can only accept email and this obviously plays into the form validation that happens password password is nothing more than a text field that obscures the 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 actual letters into dots so an example of that would be if we then preview this and go like this of course it's obscured but by simply changing the type to text we can see the password and that's all if you want to do some javascript that want you want to show and hide what the password is for whatever reason all you do is change the type to text toggle it between text and password but nothing more clever than that uh, the phone number is an, a new type of um, input field because n what we would in the old days what we what typically people would make the mistake of is actually if you want a telephone number you would put it as a number but what you'll see is is that again if we preview this you'll see the up and down kind of things here and you do some CSS to, to, to hide them when it was not necessary you you would have should have put a text plain text and then you can use the pattern um, pattern attribute which actually um, you can put in regular expressions to actually prevent or allow certain types so if you only wanted numbers then you would do something like this you know um, various things like that it's quite a clever way to to only restrict to restrict what a user can actually put into the um, to to the input field and then finally we've got number which as i said well just to wrap up then so the phone is actually a new one called tell which obviously only accepts telephone numbers um, and then number is the number field and once again i would i would encourage you to you know search um well let's have a look at number for instance number you know i would encourage you to look into these and actually see what attributes are available for that input type you might actually find that there's some clever things you can do stepping for instance only allows you to um, add or remove plus 10 or 5 or 3 whatever take a look at the documentation because i think it's really really powerful what you can what you can do with that stuff as long as you know how to read the documentation that's it for the text element so let's dive into another input type and kind of just explain it so we've got a file upload which once again is just an input type of file right um this is like a paid for feature but I, I i don't know whether this is actually restricted but there's you could put an input type of file and have that you know play a part in your uh, in your form um again it's just a, an element of input with type of file 
nothing more complex than that. Text area, once again, um, is very, very sim similar to an input field of type text, just so you can have multiple lines and multiple columns. So you don't really get much in the way of settings here, but I encourage you to look at the documentation because I know there's a lot of things you can do with a text area. Um, oh, it's a text area. It's not an input type. So there we go. Um, attributes, you can auto capitalize, you can auto complete, auto correct, auto focus, columns, disabled, form, max length, all this stuff um, might allow you to enhance what you're doing with the, uh, the text area. Looking at the next form field, now checkbox and radio. I think these two kind of come as a pair because often people actually get quite confused with them. So a checkbox is a set of elements. So you can, uh, you, you'll have multiple um, checkboxes as long as each of those checkboxes have the same name. So let's, you know, this is the default name of checkbox. If I create multiple checkboxes, So as long as they have the, name, the same name of uh, the same name, they will belong together, and they they get submitted as a of the name checkbox. I mean that's a terrible name. Let's use a let's use a a realistic example here. Contact preferences, for instance, uh, and if we change the name to contact preferences on both of these, and then this one with the, also a name of contact preferences, you could have email. You could have postal or telephone or whatever, and then this will get sent up as one sort of um, entry in the database to say their contact preferences are, checkboxes are good for multiple values of the same grouping of, of elements. Radio buttons, on the other hand, are a set of elements where the user can only select one of the input types. So a good example of this would be uh, gender or something like that. Uh, male, female, other, and you know you might provide another one there for different types of genders. That would be if you only, you only want the user to select one of that group of elements. So you can make these look however you'd like. An example of this where you might not know that it's an input would be a, a tabs component, for instance, where once you select one tab, it shows the content of of the uh, of that represents that tab when you select the other tab it represents the content of that tab technically you could make that with pure html and css with zero javascript because the user can only select one item of those tabs at any one time and you can use a radio button to do that there's a website which i've seen that i can't find just just now uh, it actually shows you a bunch of components menus various things like that that they just use form elements with no JavaScript. So it's quite, quite clever what you can do. But the important thing to remember is checkboxes are multiple uh, entries for a set of, uh, set of data. And then radio buttons are a single entry for a set of data. Looking at the re how the radio button is rendered, taking a look at this. So here they've wrapped the entire thing in a label and they've not used the for attribute, which is also valid HTML. So if you don't use the form attribute, then make sure that you're wrapping your inputs within the, within the label. Um, it's of type radio, so it's just an input once again of type radio. And then they're linked, all your radio buttons are linked with the same name. So you must use the same name if, and, and we can just demonstrate that real quick. So we've got two radio buttons here, group name, uh, gender, gender. If we have a look at these, but because they have the same name here and here, it knows they belong together. So we're going to only select one, whereas here I can select multiple. Another thing to note about checkboxes is if you, if you select on here and add an attribute to the checkbox, the input, the actual input itself, you can tell it to automatically be checked. So checked equals checked. Same with um, checkboxes. Has to be the actual input. Uh, checked equals checked. Then when we publish that, 
then you can pre-select them, okay? Uh, I guess a, a point to note is that if you want to, you could make these required field, but technically you're making it required by pre-selecting one value. They can't then unselect that value. So this is in theory creating a required field or a required set of um, inputs just by saying one of them is checked. Jumping back into our fields, a select box, really there's not much uh, there's not much to say about a select box. You can obviously have multiple choices. Um, allowing multiple sets a different type of checkbox where you can obviously just select multiple examples. If we take a look at how that's rendered, it's just a select field and has a name and that's about it or an ID if you're going to be using the field. If you have a look at when we select allow multiple and how that changes the the select field, if we look at the code, then what you can see is uh, there should be an attribute of multiple and that's all that is doing. You're just adding a an attribute of multiple. Similarly, now recaptures, I think this probably deserves its own episode, episode but recaptures are a way of preventing bots. Um, from submitting data into your form. There's various different types. I'm not quite sure what version Webflow are using at the moment, but it could be version two. Version three is actually a hidden bot that you don't see and it doesn't kind of clutter your page. Alternatively, uh, an option that I do is called a honeypot. And what this does, and you'll need to write your own JavaScript to handle the form, which we'll hopefully get to in this series. You have a hidden checkbox that is unchecked right in your javascript you prevent the submission of a form if this is checked so when you click submit so form on submit if this is unchecked so if checkbox is unchecked and i'm pseudo coding right now we get into this in another episode but i'm pseudo coding right now if this is unchecked then submit the form if it is checked then don't do anything the reason why that's effective against bots is that bots tend to want to fill out every single form element on the on the form page. It just goes through them all and checks them all. It's not 100% effective, of course, but what you might want to do is put something in it uh, saying, if you are a human, ignore this checkbox. So just in case a human does latch onto it or whatever, then that they know to ignore that checkbox uh, and you'd hide it with the SR only class which I'll link to in the card if you're interested in SR only and it's it's you know legitimate use cases then um, this will be a perfect example for that so that's a honeypot and a way that you can defer bots from actually submitting the data on your page if you didn't want to use recapture or if recapture is confusing you I know you have to set it up with Google and and register an application and all the rest of it so that's another way you can defer bots. So finally, we have a submit button, which is actually just an input of type submit, as we previously discussed. And good thing is what we discovered earlier that actually all inputs can, can have the um, form attribute. And this, this tends to suggest that you can have uh, elements outside of your form and link to the submission of a form um, from elsewhere on the page. Typically, I would, I've used that in the past of a, of a submit button outside of the form. When that button is clicked, then you can use that. So that's the only, I guess, nugget of information I can show on a submit button. But in the context of Webflow, of course, you can select the waiting text um, and, and button text here. If you did want to create your own button, as I mentioned earlier, you would need to go into your um, components here and not have any other submit buttons and just by the very fact that this is inside a form means that this button will be forever linked to your form and now in here you can put some svgs you know you can have other texts um, and as long as this of type equals submit then this will now submit that form. So if we close that SVG there, now you can have graphics, icons, or or whatever in your in your um, in your form. And then if I preview, you can see that if I click that, then you'll get some um, page valid uh, form validation here. 
So the last thing to note is that you might want to watch my video on focus states. I think having a focus state in your form is very, very important. So instead of explaining again here, I'll direct you to my focus video where you can understand the importance of focus states in Webflow. So I hope this was useful. Episode one of this whistle stop tour of an introduction to forms. If, if you want me to go into any detail on any of those things, I'll be happy to and include it in the next episode. But in the next episode, I think what we'll do is we'll start actually manipulating and listening to this form and, and responding to this form with our own JavaScript. So if you like this episode, please hit the like button because that's the easiest way to let me know that you actually want more of this content. Uh, and if you want to stay up to date with more episodes on forms and Webflow, then hit the subscribe button. And generally, this episode really is all about front end development and accessibility in particular. So if you want to support the channel, then you can support me over at patreon.com slash fake Sam Gregory. And until next time, happy no coding.